This is going to be verse by verse of 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Starting in verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So, you know, around this time of year, Halloween is just over. All you see is scary stuff everywhere. Uh, Halloween just keeps on going. You walk into the grocery store, you see witches, werewolves, vampires, and everything else. But what is really scary? The fact that there is an almighty God watching everything you do should be a fearful thing. But can also be a comfort. That is why you want to perfect holiness in the fear of God. Since the word therefore is in verse 1, that shows you that it, it's a continuation from the last chapter. He says, having therefore these promises. And at the end of chapter 6, he was talking about being separate from the world. The promise is that if you separate yourself from the ungodly, then God will receive you and be a father to you. This is practically speaking because doctrinally, he always is and always will be. A Christian's father you became a son of God the moment you got saved John 1 12 says but as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name but the thing is when you got saved your flesh didn't get saved along with your soul that is why you still have a problem with sin and that is why you need to be perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That is why you need to cleanse yourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. The promise of fellowship with the Father should motivate you to clean your life up. Why do you act just like a lost person? I've known preachers that I didn't even know they were a preacher until a couple months of knowing them they told me because they just didn't act like one. 2 Corinthians 7 2 receive us. We have wronged no man, we have corrupted no man, we have defrauded no man. A good testimony comes from how you are around others. You ruin your testimony by wronging, corrupting, and defrauding people. But Paul says he's done none of those things. But how many times have you heard someone say, That man is a preacher, but he did this or that? Or I thought that man was a Christian, but he did such and such to me. Uh, I thought that man was a pastor, but he flirts with all the women at work. Um, I've seen pastors chase young women at work. It ruined their testimony with the lost people at work. Especially if it was uh, the, the man's girlfriend that the pastor was flirting with. It, that really makes you lose your testimony pretty fast. Uh, Paul says, receive us here because in the previous chapter it said in 2 Corinthians 6 17 wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate saith the Lord and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you so Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7 2 receive us we have wronged no man we have corrupted no man we have defrauded no man so he's wronged no man and Paul would admit if he did because he was willing to even put Onesimus's wrongs on himself on his own account so that Philemon would receive Onesimus back as he said in Philemon 18 if he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught put that on mine account Paul wouldn't have corrupted no man Paul wouldn't have wronged no man and not taken responsibility for it Paul wouldn't have corrupted them because he was focused on not letting anybody corrupt them he was focused on not letting anybody corrupt the Corinthians. So why would he corrupt them? As he says in 2 Corinthians 11, 3, But I fear lest by any means, as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. Paul isn't going to corrupt them. He's too busy worried about making sure they're not getting corrupted. He wouldn't defraud them because he believed in working with his own hands. He believed in paying his way. He believed what's yours is yours. And he said, let them... Let them that stole steal no more in Ephesians 4.28. So he's not going to defraud the Corinthians. The Apple company was supposedly making their customers' phones start malfunctioning when they were getting close to time for an upgrade on their phone. And they did this so that they would have to go out and spend more money to buy another phone. That's being deceitful. That's wronging people, defrauding people. 
James 2, 6, But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats. The rich men of this world are the ones behind the root of all evil that's going on. They want more and more because the eyes of men are never satisfied. The rich men will defraud to get richer. Now verse 3, 2 Corinthians 7, 3. I speak not this to condemn you, for I have said before that ye are in our hearts to die and live with you. Paul doesn't just say all this stuff to go at their throat. He says it because he cares about the Corinthians. They are in his heart. Paul will go to spiritual war with the Corinthians to help them. He'll die to the flesh and live with them. And you aren't really living in this world unless you're dying daily to the flesh and living for God and somebody else. 2 Corinthians 7, 4. Great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. Paul is bold in his speech toward them. He wasn't using flattering words as those corruptors use. In 1 Thessalonians 2, 5, he says, For neither at any time use we flattering words as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. Paul said, Great is my glorying of you. He spoke about the good characteristics of the Corinthians to other people. 2 Corinthians 7, 4, Great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. Even though Paul was going through tribulations of his own, the fact that the Corinthians were doing better was a comfort to him. And most people today get mad and jealous of other people when they are successful because they hate their own lives so much. But Paul loved to see his converts fight the good fight. He is filled with comfort when they are living for God and not outliving for the devil. 2 Thessalonians 1, 4 says, So that we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. Some things that make serving God better is seeing the success of someone that you helped. In 2 Corinthians 7, 5, For when we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side with outward fightings, with inward fears. Everywhere Paul looked, he had something bad happening. He was physically abused for the face, faith, he was being slandered. He was suffering shipwreck. He was having false brethren. Everywhere he looked, his flesh had no rest. He was troubled on every side. And in verse 6, he says, Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus. Titus came and gave, gave good news to Paul about the Corinthians. This is the Titus that Paul writes to in the book of Titus. Now verse 7, And not by, this, by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you, when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoice the more. Titus came and told Paul about the consolation he got from the Corinthians. Consolation is comfort. And Titus told Paul about their earnest desire. That is what people are lacking today is an earnest desire they may be saved they may go to church every service they may be good moral people but they have no desire to do anything for god or to read the bible or to pray and my main burden for these studies i do here is to put a desire in someone to read and study the bible uh, i see tons of men already in their 50s and 60s and they don't know any bible i talked to a 60 something year old man who claims to be a christian and goes to church and he didn't even understand what I meant when I've said 66 books of the Bible. He said, I, I just thought it was one book. He, did, he never heard of 66 books of the Bible. And that's a sad thing that people are growing old and gray-headed and they have no wisdom. They have no knowledge of the Bible. But I want to be responsible for getting people interested in the Bible. I want God to use me to do that. I don't care about being responsible for making them wear a tie or to give money or any of that other stuff that people have a burden about. All of these traditional things. I want God to use me to, ha to move people to get into the Bible. I want them to have an earnest desire. I had a Sunday school teacher and I could tell if people weren't saying amen or nodding their head or doing something like that. Then he was discouraged. He thought that meant he wasn't doing good. But when I teach I don't care about that stuff. You can be quiet as a mouse. I don't look for signs that I'm doing good. What I like to see is someone who brings their Bible maybe taking notes in it while I teach or in some type of notepad and have their Bible marked up or a page marked up when I look down at it. That just shows me that they have a desire to learn the Bible. 
I'm not a good orator. I'm not going to be able to excite someone by my enthusiasm or by my voice. So I just study extra hard and learn as much as I can and load them down with truth and facts and maybe add some shock value in there to try to get people interested. But my main burden is to get people interested in the Bible. Give someone an earnest desire to read the Bible, to learn. 2 Corinthians 7, 8, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. The first letter to the Corinthians was rough. Remember how he had to get on them about the fornication problems? And after he sent the letter, he felt kind of bad about it because it was so rough. But then he came back to himself and realized they really needed it and it was for their own good. So that's why he says, I do not repent, though I did repent. He felt bad about it, but then he realized, well, they really did need that. Sometimes a preacher might preach a sermon and leave and was like, wow, I was a little harsh. And then later he decided, well, they really did need that, so I'm glad I did that. So 2 Corinthians 7, 8, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I, for I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. It only made them sorry for a season. It didn't permanently have them down in the dumps. They got right, and they moved on with serving God. And he says in verse 9, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you, may, for you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. So they were made sorry after a godly manner. <clears throat> and they sorrowed to repentance. Some people can repent, but not after a godly manner. For example, Judas in Matthew 27, 3. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. Judas didn't repent until he saw that he was condemned, and then he hanged himself. You might not repent until you get caught, but the fact that Judas hanged himself shows he had the sorrow of the world and not godly sorrow. If he was really sorry for what he did to the Lord and not just sorry he got caught, he wouldn't have hanged himself. 2 Corinthians 7.10 For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. You shouldn't repent of godly sorrow. That leads to true repentance. But there is a false repentance. The sorrow of the world may cause someone to repent. And many will use this verse uh, to prove that a person isn't really saved if they continue in sin after getting saved. Uh, repentance to salvation does not mean quit sinning. You're turning from a lot relying on yourself to relying on Jesus Christ. You change your unbelief into belief. When you were lost, you were trusting in something, but it wasn't Jesus Christ. When you got saved, you changed your mind. You stopped relying on your own righteousness and looked to Jesus Christ and His righteousness. So for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Remember that the man in 1 Corinthians 5 repented and got right. Paul encouraged them to comfort him and accept him back into the assembly, and the young man's godly sorrow led him to repentance. He did not have sorrow of the world like Judas. So when he was turned over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, he repented and did not die. The sorrow of the world worketh death. But repenting with godly sorrow keeps you alive because it keeps you from committing the sin until you die. As John talks about a sin unto death. There is a sin unto death. 2 Corinthians 7, 11, For behold the selfsame thing that you saw after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. In all things you have reproved, approved yourself to be clear in this matter. So carefulness. Paul says carefulness. You tried to stay away from committing the same sin again. Do whatever it takes. Carefulness. Clearing of yourselves. It was clear what they needed to get fix. fixed. Indignation. They were mad about their sin that, they had them, that had them in bondage. Fear. They feared God and it caused them not to do it anymore. Vehement desire. You have a great desire never to do it again. Zeal. They are now eager to please God. Revenge. Now they want to expose the sin that had them in bondage. Now verse 12, Wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did it not for his cause that had done the wrong, nor for his cause that suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. I believe he's referring back to the man who committed fornication with his father's wife back in the first epistle in chapter 5. And he wrote it not for the cause of the man who did the wrong, 
or the one who suffered wrong, which would be the boy's father, but for the church at Corinth. The church was the most important thing to him. He wanted the care he had for them to appear to them. If someone shows a concern about what you're doing wrong, it may seem like they're being mean, but it actually just shows that they care. Now, verse 13, Therefore we were comforted in your comfort, yea, and exceeding the more joyed we were for the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you all. Sometimes you can get around a Christian that refreshes you. Maybe they really live it and remind you about when you were refreshing to someone else. When you get around a Christian who cusses and never talks about the Bible, they send forth a stinking savor. As it talks about in 2 Corinthians 2, 15 and 16, where it says, For, for we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and them that, in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? So you can be refreshing to somebody or you can be a stinking savor to somebody as a Christian. You, you want to be refreshing. Now verse 14, For if I have boasted anything to him of you, I am not ashamed. But as we spake all things to you in truth, even so our boasting, which I made before Titus, is found a truth. Paul was glad because he told Titus good things about them. And when Titus arrived there, he found out that what Paul said was true. 2 Corinthians 7, 15, And his inward affection is more abundant towards you, whilst he remembereth the obedience of you all, how with fear and trembling you received him. So how does a preacher or teacher remember you when they come to your church? Do they remember your obedience? Or do they remember something like that you fell asleep like Eutychus did when Paul was preaching? So Paul uh, remembered the obedience of them, how with fear and trembling you received him. Titus did. He remembered good things about him. Now, verse 16, I rejoice, therefore, that I have confidence in you in all things. The way they were with Titus greatly affected Paul's confidence in the Corinthians. So this has been 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse by verse.